We're delighted to have you back. So this is our show, uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And this is our 252nd show. And if you're watching us live, you will be our 13,412th viewer. Great. So we is you, uh, DeSoto Brown, in your Chile Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Good day, everybody, and good day, Martin. And me, uh, Martin Despang, near Munich. We're like 8,000 miles apart, like the most you can be. So we're all over the places. And also we're geopolitically, uh, geoeconomically, geoecologically all messed up all over the place, right? Um, with uh, all these, almost as it feels, I'm, I'm sure all that, you know, when there were challenges in, in times, they all thought it's unprecedented, but this time it really seems like there's a lot going down and coming at us. So how can you even talk about and think about anything else than all these challenges um, of uh, climate change, coronavirus, war in the Ukraine, resulting or around that, you know, fossil fuel challenges, um, uh, food crises, um, all these things, right? But um, the human nature also is um, that life goes on and needs to go on. And if we can get the first slide up, we want to basically continue where we stopped last time, which is with our dogs. Um, uh, you are not with your real dogs today, nor am I with my sister's dogs. But, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about that. Um, you know, the fauna dogs uh, are, you know, smarter in, in several ways because they don't do anything to themselves or to the world that would bite them back, right? Talking biting and barking dogs, they wouldn't do that. But we human beings, we endanger our flora, our planet, and then we get ourselves in trouble. So, um, you know, that being said, um, let people in these challenging days, they try to hold on to things they know, to sort of practices, proven practices, so to speak, to traditions. And these traditions embody through, uh, for example, things we wear, right? The, mm -hmm. the attire. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about last time about cultural costumes that in your case, and in my case, our cultures sometimes somehow turn into uniforms because yes. economically that's how we lure people to mm -hmm. the Oktoberfest and we show off with our journals and later hosen and over there you basically show off with a hula skirt and with a coconut bra and the like <laughs> right which is not how people would have you know to dress anymore it's actually sort of inappropriate given that we have changed as cultures, but we pretend to still be like that. And that's a little odd, right? In, in yes. several ways. Yes. And, and so, um, but speaking positively, um, this is the uh, anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Olympics um, that we had in 72 here in Munich. And this is sort of, we have currently the week uh, where there are the most um, uh, events going on to celebrate that and also to commemorate that because it was also the fair that uh, tried to be tragically interrupted by a bad terrorist attack uh, that was targeting the Israeli athletes and several of them uh, lost their life, including one a German police officer. But uh, always remembering that, and there's certainly a place for that to remember that, rightly so. But uh, they didn't let this basically become the main memory of the game. The main memory remains that Germany really tried to get over its darkest days before that of the Third Reich and present and represent itself as a new democratic culture that thanks to you Americans, had learned the lessons, right? And how does the, 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 the Valdi, which is the name of the sausage dog, wiener dog, duck's dog play into that? So that fascinated you. Well, 
this was the creation probably i i'm saying that with some some little hesitation but i think this was the first time that any olympics had an official mascot now today every olympics i think is required to do that and there's a lot of discussion that goes into creating a cute cartoon character who then gets turned into plush toys and other things like that that people buy as souvenirs well, in 1972 in Germany, they created this striped multicolored dachshund slash wiener dog. And uh, his name is Valdi or Waldi. And he is uh, a cute symbol of Germany. We were discussing what are other German symbols could there be? Well, a German shepherd dog is also a symbol, but that is a aggressive dog that bites and barks and is used by policemen and military so we don't and want by that. the way by the way hitler had one so and by the way no hitler role. had one too so we're not going to associate ourselves with that we will associate ourselves with this cute wiener dog which actually was bred as a hunter to hunt badgers we just discussed that before the show badgers being something that farmers wanted to fight against because they kill chickens but nonetheless Dachshunds today are purely cute and they're purely kept as pets. We mm. also see too in this display that uh, on the left side is a picture of the female uniforms which were created for hostesses at the Olympics, particularly in the Olympic Village. And it's based on the Dirndl outfit, which is actually part of native German culture, but it was redesigned to look more modern. It isn't made of the same fabrics. And it's also this nice light blue color, which doesn't have any associations with anything militant, militaristic, anything with World War II, sunny, bright colors, striped doggy and light blue uniforms on pretty young girls are all part of a plan to make this more palatable, more attractive, more fun and more appealing to people from around the world and That's in that right. they succeeded yeah and that was all gestalted by uh who's part of the old school of design Otto Eicher, who created the whole ci the corporate identity for the olympics uh the mascot was invented by a female employee of his and again as you said already uh black and red and brown were no-go colors. They were connotated by the darkest days of Hitler and the Third Reich. So only these sort of still virgin and not basically already abused colors were used. And you see here the head of Valdi. And I had one at the age of six, what I was, and 72. I had a rubber Valdi that you could take the individual rings, color rings off and reassemble them. And I'm missing that when I look for it, I don't find it. So maybe <laughs> I gave it away to someone. So the head of Valdi with that with that light, uh, um, sunny sky blue, basically matches the uh, the the interpreted journal again. Yeah, that's something. This is not basically because we also talked that both you guys loin classes and 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 grass skirts. Uh, were very pragmatically, utilitarianly derived, right? Because it was mm -hmm. like, okay, how can I survive, hunt and farm and, you know, and, and harvest uh, fruits in a way that I don't lose more energy that I can afford? It was as simple as that, because there was no button pushing or shipping in Hess avocados from Mexico or things like that didn't weren't or or buying a Hilo Hati Aloha shirt out of uh, polyester that is made in China that all didn't exist right and so it was with the dirndl the fabric of the dirndl is loden which is a very tightly woven wool and that basically in the predominantly cold times here which is not just in the winter uh, brutally cold but also the summer and we have only maybe two handfuls of tropical nights that you have in Hawaii all the time maybe we have 10 of these otherwise the nights are pretty pretty chilly so you need that but you know we have we're not living in a basically you know un or just you know minimally heated buildings with uh, wood fireplaces and stuff like that what they had way back we're all having, you know, very, very Western standards, which gets us in trouble because comes the next winter without Putin's gas and oil, we're really scratching our heads. Uh, but at least in the past, that was the case. So things basically evolve. 
So that's one of our favorite topics to so that we talk about in one of your favorite talks that I always revisit. And before the show, you were just watching what I sent you the link to your recent talk at the Lilia Strand Foundation up there where you gave a talk. But my, the one I'm recalling is the, um, the evolution of the tradition of innovation. That's right. Which, which they tried here with the attributes around. But how about the architecture more particularly? You, of course, Correct. see here already at the bottom right, the famous uh, tent structure by Fra Otto and Günther Benisch on where uh, the, the sports events were. But next uh, slide. Uh, one of our utmost challenges of these days uh, is uh, housing. And, and that's something, um, you know, um, we're, we're talking about quite a bit and continue to have to talk about. So in this case here, until two weeks ago, uh, I felt bad, but um, I was always saying what you see at the top right, show quoted, which is the Olympic Village and this terraced uh, high density housing that still uh, allowed through the clever way of um, having these uh, killings worth Larry Stricker and uh, Ron Lindgren uh, work known uh, planted balustrade troughs uh, created lots of privacy while being very dense. I was saying, well, that's the best together with Fry Otto's tent escape uh, is the best we Germans have ever been able to accomplish, which is quite shocking because that was a 50 years ago. So have we not evolved? And I'm very happy to now share with uh, you and everyone else, and we've been talking about that before the show, that from now on, I can say, again, the uh, reconnecting to that has happened with this project here. So let's share a little bit. So what of the things we've been talking about impressed you the most about it? So. Okay, well, there's a lot that's super interesting. Uh, first of all, it has a step, the same stepped viewpoint of the same stepped facade that the Munich uh, Olympic Village has. That means that you are set back on the upper floors. And when you look down, there are baffles that cover up the people below you. So you don't look down and invade their privacy. And I, I will say too, that the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel does have the same kind of uh, facade yeah. too. So that, that's, not, that's not totally new. But it also has, so as you can see too, there are these canvas strips or fabric strips that help to preserve privacy. Between each of the lanais of this building, there are planters containing, in this case, a type of bamboo. And so that serves as a privacy screen without it actually being made of an inert material. This is a passive structure. It is self-sufficient. It has, as you could see, uh, photovoltaic units all cover the entire roof. It also contains gardens for people who live there to grow their own food during, admittedly, the brief summer season that Germany has. And it's got a lot of other innovative features for the people who live there. We were discussing how this was a piece of government property. The city sold it. They sold it to a, or they had a competition for an architecture, for architects to design something for the site that would be passive, that would be innovative. Uh, they successfully got a, a particular couple were the winners of that competition. And then the people who eventually bought into the building, because this is all owner occupied structure, they put the money in to help actually construct it because they put their money in before it even existed. And then the individual members of this, what we would say here was a hui, meaning a group, a business group in this case, got together and they did the research themselves to find the features that they wanted for the installation in this building. And uh, they then stuck together through COVID. Uh, they helped educate their kids who weren't in school. They helped each other for anybody who was sick or needed stuff. So what it turned into was a whole social thing. In addition to an innovative building, the inhabitants of the building turned into a successful social group as well. So to me, it isn't just the architecture, although that is outstanding. It is how it all came about and what the end result was for the people who live there. 
And Absolutely. I mean, I'm amazed. This is, you know, as yeah. you said, this is, it's just as good as, in fact, better than the yeah, Olympic it Village. Is. It is. It's evolved. It's just like what, you know, then was then and now is now. And things have moved on and we have more, more tools and more means and methods. And I found this out. There's a logo in the bottom left image there at the middle. Takta Architektur is the day of architecture. That's what we have also in, in Hawaii and in Honolulu, which is Architecture Week or Architecture Month. And there were about, each state has that. And I selected one project to look at uh, out of like almost a hundred and bingo, what a jackpot. And uh, uh, tellingly, um, the architect whose name is Valentin, we quote at the bottom right uh, picture at the top, there is their website, which is that husband and wife team. Uh, they basically didn't even present. They had their very convinced owners and occupants basically present so convincingly, it was, it was amazing. And if anyone is prepared for all the problems that we just, we all know, and we just reiterated, right? They are prepared, they're out of trouble because they can really sit back and relax because they're gonna stay warm through the next winter without Putin's oil or gas. They're gonna have food. Uh, they're gonna be happy and helping each other. Uh, they're really, really a good raw model. And you pointed out at the bottom right, an architectural detail also looks very familiar to you, right? Yes, because the uh, railing has a mesh rather than bars, rather than glass, which we do not like. And the mesh has a lot of uh, positive attributes, but one of the things that you have shown me earlier was a dormitory that a, a for college in Germany, in which the building was enwrapped in a mesh on which a vine was grown. So that was a method of shading. It was a method of creating oxygen, creating a better environment for the people who lived in the building. And again, we see mesh being used here. And I've become to be a fan of mesh, which is also something that is actively used in the projects that you have used uh, or helped your students design. So I want to see more mesh. Yeah. And it's also behind the mesh, you see a good moment of social sustainability here. This is, this is the kids on their bobby cars. And the, the sound insulation of this project is so superior that, you know, the, the one guiding us through said, I hardly hear them on their autobahn, on their, <laughs> on their catwalks. And this is a, this is single loaded corridor, right? And we're in Hawaii, we always hear, oh, that's not possible. The developers say, you know, that's not feasible economically. Sorry, it is, as you can tell. This project is on budget. It's not more expensive than the regular um, way to build. It's a hybrid construction. The architect is uh, known for uh, wood construction, solid timber, but here out of cost, they need to do a hybrid between concrete and wood. But nevertheless, this is amazing. This hits the spot. And once again, don't I make you jealous with that? Isn't that what we want in Hawaii? And yeah. then we can take it more easy, right? Because that triple pane glass that it uses and all this sort of hermeticizing it. So which are the four you know, rules of passive house? Orientation, yes, this is facing south, just as the Olympic Village, just as everything else should be in Hawaii. But the other three parts we don't need in Hawaii which is insulation we don't need, which is uh, heat recovery and which is air tightness, we don't need that. So, you know, we can build way cheaper and we should. And next slide, that's what we're promoting to bring home uh, to our islands. Top again is uh, buildings like that. Um, as the Primitiva threes, they are sprouting here. And we've been talking about, again, um, our politicians, um, Barack Obama, we need to lobby for this one, uh, Senator Stanley Chang, who's our state um, senator for social housing, had just sent me his, um, his, um, his uh, newsletter, and he featured Obama speaking to architects in Chicago and you know trying to get down to the root of again the, the social housing crisis so we need politicians and stanley i will recommend this project to him because he takes uh, delegates to vienna to learn uh, their great practices of social housing i'll recommend this one here to make a stop on the way back or on the way there next time to check out this project here 
but maybe we need other sort of celebrities or famous people to lobby for these ideas. And um, one of them we already um, talked about a while ago, show quote at the top right. And who is he and why could he be a good advocate for? Well, we, uh, we have some famous people that we can claim as uh, local boys who made good. And one of them is Bruno Mars, tremendously successful singer. He's from here. He started out as the world's youngest Elvis imitator, but the relevance that he has for this particular subject is he has talked about how he grew up in a situation of economic poverty for a time. And his father was uh, employed by Paradise Park, which was located in the back of Manoa Valley, which went which went under, it closed. They were living in a structure on the grounds without electricity, without water. That structure today is in ruins, but he has gone back there and there's a video of him standing in the roofless remnants of the home that he used to live in. Well, he knows what it's like to not have anything, even though today, of course, it's extremely successful. And he is one person who could be an advocate for social housing uh, from a standpoint of actually having experienced it and exactly. knowing what it's like. And there is a link to that uh, interview that a local reporter did with him. And they went to the park, the former park, which is now jungleized to, mm -hmm. to an extreme. And she asked him, she said, was there anything you were missing? And he was just like thinking for a little while. And then he said, no, because we had us. And that's very much along the lines as we're calling the, the collectiveness of these of these projects. They're not top down as it used to be, right? There's a demand, there's developers who just jump on that and they just do it good enough so that everyone who's desperate enough and everyone is desperate these days and increasingly lots of people at the lower end of the food chain are and they buy to, into it literally and figuratively speaking, the developer runs away with a big profit this is the opposite. This is a this is a bottom up strategy. It's like a Baugruppe or like a co op model, where as what uh, you know what Patrick, which is his real name by the way, uh, Bruno Mars is his artist name, is advocating for that. He said, you know, if if you if you work together on something and if you love each other, that's basically the key. Okay, so we had politicians, we had musicians. How about movie stars yeah. to find as advocates? Next slide. Well, right. that's, that's, that is the biggest and most successful movie star in the world right now, I would say, certainly in right. Hollywood. And that's Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And he is a product of the city of Honolulu as well. And we will see in just a second where he used to live and where he came from. But where he used to live was right around the corner, literally just a stone's throw from this project that we're looking at here, which is the Pagoda Hotel and quote, floating unquote restaurant, which doesn't actually float, but it does have waterways all around it. And it's no longer the Pagoda restaurant because one of the nearby businesses, again, right in the same neighborhood, just literally down the block, was displaced for the construction of a new high rise in our Midtown area. And it has been successfully relocated to the Pagoda. It's the Sorobal Kore uh, Korean restaurant. So it's a reuse and you've actually been there. You just went there with our publisher friend, Philip from Germany, and you got to see it for the first time. Uh, I got to see it way back in the sixties and seventies when I used to go there when it was brand new, but it is, as you said, an exotic tropical gem that is not easy to see because it's walled off and not easy to see from the street, but it still has this wonderful setting. It's a little world of a fish pond with beautiful koi and uh, these wonderful mid-century structures. And uh, the high rises are encroaching around it, but it's still there right now. Yeah, and since you mentioned Philip Moiser, we see him at the top left there in the picture. That was him when we went there and had our final uh, lunch before he went back and he invited me. Thank you, Philip. And uh, yeah, he charged us to do the uh, guide, the architectural tour guide for Honolulu that we're working on uh, with our team. Uh, back to the show quote at the top right. Um, back then, we were talking about presidents and architecture. And um, we see here that um, Duane was once offering to run for president in 2020. 
and we continue to basically um, take him up, wanting to take him up on that offer, probably more urgently needing than, uh, than ever before next time. And yes, we we're saying he grew up around the Pagoda restaurant, but uh, let's look more into that more specifically. And let's go to the next slide. And this slide is showing us, um, actually, we just give a slice of breeze block uh, as the only thing we show you about the building. But the top row of slides uh, of show quotes is uh, lining up with a panoramic view of the picture below. And it starts with at the top left is the Azure, the new blue towers. Next to it is the Alamoana building. Next to that is sort of this double um, uh, collage of uh, the new Sky Alamoana being comprised of a hotel and an apartment, excuse me, condominiums. And behind we see the central, right? And uh, to, the, to, the, to the very right is the new park uh, buildings that are currently here going up. They're just doing the foundation work. And when that is completed, you will not be able to see what you see uh, very prominent in the center of the picture below and the second to uh, right uh, show quote at the, at the top, which is Chris Smith's HMSA headquarter building, which goal was a very biochromatic one, very ambitious to say never should any sunlight hit any glass. And that's what informed the design of that building. Uh, let's in the half um, minute we have left, uh, go to the next slide very quickly, but we won't have time to talk much about it. But this is an appetizer for you uh, joining us again next week because we will share with you how um, uh, the rock Dwayne himself talks about where he lives. There is a, a link up there to a YouTube. If you're fast enough, you can already uh, you know, snap that and watch it. And then you're better prepared for us next week when we will reconvene with likely our last episode of the Midtown Flunk uh, development area around the Alamoana, our volume 17, final one. And until then, please stay very inclusively tropical, tropically inclusive. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.